So welcome everybody and a very warm welcome to Fine Practice Conversations with Wildfire Practitioners. Uh, for those new to the centre, I'm Adriana Ford. So I'm the centre manager of the Leavenham Centre for Wildfires Environment Society and your this is for today, two of our PhD students, uh, Luke Richardson Folger and Amos Hero, who are also online, and will be uh, chairing the discussion a bit later. So, the Fine Practice series aims to bring to you speakers from across the world with the aim to explore the developments and challenges in the real world of landscape fire and also reflecting on the role and opportunities of research in addressing some of these issues. And today, I want to give you a very warm welcome to our speaker, Christine Roche. And Christine works for the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry um, in Ontario and Canada. She has experience as a fire ranger, information officer, air attack officer, and currently a video editing technician with Ontario's Aviation, Forest, Fire and, Emission and Emergency Services. And so that gives her a really wide perspective from wildfires, which you're here today. Before I pass over to Christine, just a quick bit of housekeeping. I just want to make you aware that the webinar has been recorded. Um, we hope to make it available online afterwards. Um, secondly, we will have approximately 20 minutes for questions and discussions after the talk. Um, and if you do have a question during the talk, just pop it in the chat or save it till the, um, till the end. And in the Q&A, please do bear in mind how long you're talking for. Make sure everyone has a chance to speak. And also, there's no silly questions. So finally, if you do need it, you can utilise the live captures feature of the Teams by um, clicking on the triple dots, and then you can turn on live captions. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Christine. and. And uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Adriana. And thank you so much for having me. Um, I met Luke actually last summer uh, during the 2023 fire season. Um, he was over with the team doing a research project and it happened to be on a fire called Sioux Lookout 33. So um, I think what happened was I probably spun him some yarns about my fire stories and he might have thought that it would make good podcast material. So we will find out. <laughs> but um, just in the forefront, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have gotten to go out with the research team from uh, King's College as well as from the Canadian Forest Service. It was just such an excellent experience. It was so nice to see wildfire through their eyes and to get to see just how excited they are they were and um, just their dedication to their to their science and what their research is. And it really made me, you know, reassess how unique my job is to have access to wildfires, you know, just about every summer. So um, <clears throat> which has been, well, 28 seasons now. <laughs> but uh, when I first started with Aviation Forest Fire and Emergency Services, which is who I work for, um, I had learned the theory of fire uh, during boot camp, but honestly, I didn't really know what going out on wildfire looked like. And I would imagine for, you know, brand new wildfire researchers that haven't been out into the field, um, you feel the same, you know the science, but actually being on, on an active fire might seem a little bit vague. So I'd like to just sort of give a brief overview, um, paint a picture for the folks who haven't had a chance to go out into the field yet. But uh, first, oh, and these are the folks that I got to meet. <laughs> and uh, see those smiles? They were very happy. Okay, and then, um, yeah, so I'm going to get into um, wildfire management in Ontario, just a very general view. Um, take a look there. So when we look at the vast areas of northern Ontario um, that belong to the boreal forest, there's going to be areas where fire is wanted and areas where fire is detrimental. Uh, big considerations when, deter when determining appropriate response to wildfires are like the proximity of the fire to values, such as people and property. Is there forest industry within the area? Or are there First Nations Indigenous communities that have interests in certain areas? So those are just a few of the factors that fire managers have to think about when, when responding to fires. 
And there's also times when we don't respond to every fire. So part of that is linked to just the availability of resources. During extreme fire seasons, priorities have to be set to protect the safety of the public. But other reasons, um, but other reasons why we might not respond to fires is linked to the fire strategy. Ontario has an overarching requirement to consider the ecological issues and benefits that are around fire management. So in some cases, from an ecological perspective, the right thing to do is to allow some natural fire on the landscape. Uh, sure why we're not playing here. Okay. And this means, so by allowing natural fire on the landscape, Okay, so that's just a really broad overview of, um, you know, how we in Ontario respond to fires. So now let's talk about how we actually fight wildfires. And see here. Okay, actually, I believe this was my fire management clip. <laughs> so this is where we do definitely do not want fires right here and right there. It's fire bad. Um, you know, these are these are areas where we would want fire and where we actually do light fire. Um, to reduce, uh, you know, hazards around communities. And then <clears throat> certainly uh, we do really want to, um, where we can encourage those ecological benefits uh, of fire. So, you know, you get the regen, you get habitat for animals and as researchers, you know better than I um, what the ben benefits of natural fire are. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about how we actually fight wildfires. Um, depending on the fire industries, uh, the weather forecast, uh, fire, in, fire intelligence officers will give a prediction for how many fires are anticipated each day. Uh, fire managers will look at the number, at that number, and assign an appropriate number of fire crews to be on alert. So this means that the fire crew has their gear tested, loaded, and they're ready to go. And each alert has a different given time. So there's red alert, blue alert or red yellow and blue so red is immediate dispatch yellow alert is within a half an hour and blue alert is within four hours and when a fire is found each fire has its own challenges but generally speaking uh, once it's detected either through the aerial detection program or called in by the public uh, the fire managers will assess the information given and decide how to respond. So they'll look at the size, um, the intensity, and the location of, of the fire, and that will determine the type of response fire managers will need to assign. So um, yeah, so they will look at like the number of crews that are required, or if air attack is needed, or if any special equipment like sprinkler, spr sprinklers for value protection are required. So for example, um, if the initial report of a wildfire is small, typically one crew will be dispatched. Um, if they're dispatched in a helicopter,
So if they're dispatched in a helicopter, uh, once they're overhead the fire, the crew leader um, will do a scouting report back to the fire manager and request any other resources that are needed. Uh, the fire manager will also take that information in and determine if there's any other resources required. And then the crew will land, which isn't always the easiest process. Sometimes the chainsaw operator has to hover exit and cut an area for the helicopter to land. But uh, once they're landed and the gear is unloaded and then the helicopter is gone, the crew will gather and the crew leader does a safety briefing, which gives all the safety zones and then gives the instructions on how they're going to attack the fire. Then each crew member um, goes into their role, such as setting up the pump, um, laying hose, nozzling the fire, and handling the hose for the nozzle person. The main objective of initial attack is to wrap the fire with hose as quickly as possible. Um, while the nozzle person will use the pressure of water to uh, dig a fire break around the smoldering edge, as well as douse the edge of the fire, um, the uh, hose handler will assist the nozzle person as they go along. And once the fire is wrapped with hose, the crew will go, it around, it, go around it again and make an even deeper fire break. Um, here in Ontario, generally we have a fairly deep duff layer, so hand tooling just isn't practical. So when you see places like British Columbia or California, where they have um, dug out hand tool lines, that just doesn't work well in Ontario. And we're very fortunate with, um, we have a lot of lakes in Ontario. So we've got good access to water. Our, our pumps are great. They give us, you know, a lot of pressure. So we can actually dig down into the soil and make a fire break. And um, once they've gone around it enough and that they're confident that the fire's not gonna escape the hose boundary, um, they'll go in and just start hitting hot spots and they'll eventually work their way into the fire and clean up all the hot spots until they're all out. And then the fire can be called out. And I mean, depending on the fire size, it's going to, you know, it'll take uh, maybe a day for a small fire or, you know, maybe up to 10 days for a larger size fire. Okay, that's baby me. <laughs> now, um, when I became a fire ranger in 1995, um, I didn't know any of that. Uh, I really just needed a summer job uh, to pay for art school. And when I first applied, I put down Camp Cook. And then I thought, oh, well, what the heck? Let's just put Force Firefighter on the application too. And during that time, um, I was working at a tree nursery and I was out in the field and I was picking um, bundles of trees for tree planters. And I wasn't very good at it. I was probably actually losing money because it was piecework. So I heard over the foreman's radio that Ministry of Natural Resources was looking for a Christine Roche. And I thought, well, <laughs> that's me. So I jumped up and I, the foreman said that I had an interview and I didn't have long to get there. So I bolted out of the field. And uh, normally I would recommend looking your best for an interview. But I think the fact that I was grubby from kneeling in the field all day helped convince me that my inter helped convince my interviewer that I didn't mind a bit of hard work. So, um, however, being so desperate to get out of the tree nursery, I may have fudged exactly how much I knew about fighting fires. Uh, so I'd like to share a few things that I wish I knew in case any of you find yourselves um, on a fire in the boreal forest. Okay, so let's start with the legends of the terrible hordes of bugs. It's true, sometimes, not all the time. Um, I do highly recommend bringing uh, bug net, bug spray, and afterbite roll-on or lotion. 
um, especially if you're from a different province or country. Sometimes, um, you know, bugs can affect us a little bit differently if we're not used to that type of bite. Um, usually mosquitoes and black flies won't be as bad when you're out on the fire line during the heat of the day. Um, <clears throat> it's once it, once it cools off, usually when you're back at camp, they'll come out for, you know, about an hour and then they'll, you know, then they'll retreat again. And you want to do a daily tick check just to make sure you haven't been bitten by one as um, the black legged, black -legged uh, deer tick does carry Lyme's disease. Um, also, it's very rare. We don't see them very often, but there have been uh, sightings of brown recluse spiders. So you might, before you go to sleep at night in your tent, you might want to do like a, a bit of a spider hunt uh, just to make sure because their bites are, they will leave a significant wound and they do have to be treated right away. And then um, as far as our only venomous um, snake, it's the Mississauga rattler snake. And that's found um, more towards Southern Ontario. So in our um, Eastern and Southern area of our fire region, um, you'll find them. But really, um, you know, any bite if, or, yeah, any bite, if it's scratched and gets irritated, it could become infected. So it's just good to take precautions. And, uh, Moving on to larger critters, um, you'll want to take bear awareness training before you go onto the Ontario Fire Line. Now, AFFES has an e-learn course that can be taken, and I'm sure that any of the liaisons and project coordinators will be arranging all the necessary safety training for researchers to receive before they go out onto the fire line. So that's even things like, you know, helicopter safety and just, you know, how to be aware when you're walking through a fire and looking up and and making sure trees don't fall and all that sort of stuff. Okay, and um, this is a bit of an annoyance, but not the end of the world. Wet boots. <laughs> it is slightly unpleasant uh, when you have to put them on first thing in the morning. Um, if it's possible, bring a second pair just to alternate each day. Um, so then one pair can dry out while you're wearing the other. Uh, I don't see this being a huge issue for research researchers, um, just because you won't be handling hose, so you won't be soaked all day. Um, but sometimes helipads can be in open swampy areas where your feet get wet at the beginning of the day. And then um, once you go head back to camp, then your feet are going to get wet again. So you've got wet feet going into camp. Um, the best thing to do really is once you get to camp, take those wet boots off, um, have a nice dry pair of socks, comfortable shoes, and uh, put them on and just maintain your feet health because you really don't want blisters because um, it just makes walking ugh, awful. <laughs> and uh, when it comes to packing personal items like clothes and toiletries, um, I can go through a bit more of an in-depth list later if you want, or if I can get permission, I'll share. Um, we have a great document, it's called Personal Hygiene on the Fire Line, and it's just things that I really wish I would have known my first year of fire, like wet wipes. Just bring wet wipes. <laughs> bring as many as you can. They're the best. <laughs> So if I can get permission, then um, certainly I'll, I'll share the document. And yeah, it's just handy to go through. Okay, so a little bit more serious, well, a lot more serious actually, um, heat illness, which includes heat exhaustion and heat stroke. They are serious concerns. Um, I've had heat exhaustion a few times and I really do not recommend it. Uh, it can sneak up on you and especially if you're super engaged with your work and you're under a time crunch. So prevention is the best approach. Taking regular breaks, working in the shade as much as possible and drinking moderate amounts of water but often will help prevent heat illness. 
Um, it is also important to recognize the signs of heat exhaustion early so that it doesn't progress into heat stroke. Um, starting by feeling thirsty, if you're lightheaded, dizzy, start to get a little bit crampy, um, or just feel really drained of energy. Those are some of the symptoms. If you notice these, let someone on your team know and get to a shaded area and take in water slowly, but often, so your body can absorb it. And also adding some electrolytes to your water can help with recovery. Okay. And sort of along those lines as well, uh, when you're on an active fire, smoke and ash exposure can leave you feeling sick and with a headache and, and nauseous. So avoid standing directly in the smoke as much as possible. Um, if you're walking through the burn with team members, walk beside them rather than behind them so that you're not breathing up all the ash that's being kicked up. Um, another tip about ash is to Velcro or tape the bottom of your pant leg securely around your boots. Um, this keeps ash from going up your pant legs and it will just keep your legs a lot cleaner because depending on where you are, you might not get a shower every night. So <clears throat> speaking of every night, <laughs> uh, sometimes there will be rugged sleeping conditions. Um, it's good to be mentally prepared to sleep in a small tent with only a thin thermos pad separating you and the ground. Um, then anything better than that seems great. So if you have space in your pack, I suggest bringing a small travel pillow just to make sleeping a bit more comfortable. And even if you use like earplugs or an eye mask, um, anything small that you can bring to improve your sleep, then uh, definitely bring it. You know, getting a good night's sleep is really, um, you know, it's going to ensure a lot more productive day. It's also going to help you recover a lot better, especially if you did get a little bit too much sun the day before. So good rest as much as you can. Sometimes it's a challenge out there. And um, these are really typical base camps that, that you'll see if you do go out to a base camp. And um, depending how remote the fire is, you may end up with very rustic cooking <laughs> arrangements, propane stoves, limited utensils, and box coolers for fridges are all a reality of camping. It takes a little more effort to prepare your meals um, when you don't have a full kitchen. And it can be a burden to make dinner when you come back from camp and it's been a long day and you're just exhausted. But if you plan it out um, as a group uh, and then take turns making meals. So, you know, just plan that two people are gonna do breakfast and then uh, two people will prepare lunch for on the line. And then um, two people or a few extra people will get together and cook dinner. And I know when we're out on uh, Sulukout 33, we all pitched in and it was a really great time. And then when you sit down and share meals, um, you really get to know each other and it's pretty fun. So speaking of food, sometimes supplies can be a little limited. So if you have a specific coffee or tea or protein powder or bars that you cannot live without and you have a little extra room in your pack, uh, bring some along. Depending on the agency you're working with, they may not be able to supply the brand names foods that you're used to. And if you do bring food, make sure you put it in the dining tent. Don't leave it in your personal tent um, because you do not want to smell extra good to bears. Um, <clears throat> hmm. 
I think my videos are a little frozen. But anyways, um, when you when I am talking about supplies, um, I'm not referring to just food. This also includes equipment. So think about all the things you need to run the equipment that you use for collecting data and everything you need for processing that data. How often does your equipment break? What tools and supplies would you need to fix it? Um, if you're in a remote location with limited time, you wanna make sure you have everything you need to keep your equipment up and running. Um, anything from like extra O-rings to electrical tape. And even with all the planning in the world, um, there will still be times when you have to MacGyver things together just to get the job done. And I'm using MacGyver as a verb. <laughs> it's a, uh, a bit of a cheesy Canadian show, but I love it. Um, okay, well, I did have a photo of a cell phone taped to a tripod um, in the office actually, when you shouldn't have to MacGyver things, but we did. And it was for an interview for an information officer to do a live interview with a news station. So sometimes you even have to MacGyver things in the office. And that was leading me into my information officer role. <laughs> so maybe I'll pull up the photo later. Um, but yeah, moving on to just getting the job done. Um, as an information officer, uh, you know, something, sometimes you did have to like just get things together because a lot of the time um, information's coming at you very fast, especially during a really busy fire season. So as an information officer, I was responsible for keeping the public informed of the current fire situation. Um, a few of the duties that were involved were speaking to the public directly, um, fielding media calls and writing media updates. And um, full disclosure, I was terrified of public speaking. Uh, still am a little bit, but, uh, and it was a big challenge. It was, um, you know, it was, it was difficult to get past that and uh, be able to do the job, but I really needed the job. So, <laughs> so you just push through and I had an excellent mentor who really helped me. And um, I, I really think it helped me further along in my career as well. So um, now that I'm in my video editing role, I work really closely, closely with the information officers. So we share photos and footage back and forth because now, like when I was doing it, we didn't have social media, but they have social media campaigns that they have to fill. And those are, hmm, I'm oh, sorry about that. My videos aren't playing very well, but um, yeah, so we share back and forth. And I'm very fortunate because um, pretty much every information officer that we have is an excellent photographer. So I get to glean their material and use it for my training projects. So that's awesome. And then, hmm. yeah, I think it's just getting a little bit jammed, but we'll move on. After being an information officer, I went back into operations and became an air attack officer. And, um, what an air attack officer does mainly, well, most importantly, um, I was half of a team. The other half of the team was the bird dog pilot. So together we would do airspace management, uh, making sure that all the aircraft over the fire were maintaining safe distances. So vertically it's always 500 feet. And if it's horizontally, um, you just make sure you have a very clear boundary so that um, aircraft don't cross into each other's space. I would let the water bombers know where all the crews were on the ground. And I would direct the water bombers where to drop on the fire. And I would work directly with the incident commander over the fire to make a plan of attack. Um, and all of this while monitoring up to about eight channels at a time. So it was, it was a very busy, intense job. 
but I found when I was on missions, I was just so focused that the time would evaporate. And although, as I was saying, it seems unrelated, my information officer role really helped me on the communications end of the job. I think um, if I hadn't gotten over my shyness, um, having to do all the radio work um, would have been a big challenge for me. And also, of course, my fire ranger experience was invaluable for the operational part of the role. Um, being able to read fires from the air it was a crucial part of the job. So you just, um, like, you see so many fires, you just eventually instinctually know what that fire is going to do. And you really get to know what the water bombers are capable of. So you can, you'll know which area of the fire you can work and you're going to be effective and which area you just have to let go. And, you know, above and beyond the excitement of it, because it was, it was very exciting. Um, one of the other things I really loved about it was just the professionalism of, you know, working within aviation, because our pilots and our um, aircraft maintenance en engineers, they trained to have a unique set of skills that allowed them to do, you know, really challenging types of flying. And they took it very seriously and they loved it. And being around that instilled in me how important my role was and just kind of infused me with a sense of pride. So I often say that if I wasn't doing the job I'm doing now, then I would still be an air attack officer. Oh. All right. Show's going to go on. <laughs> That's too bad. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I should pull up my uh, editing. Hmm. Oh, well, I'll play them in the background um, while we're chit chatting. How about that? Um, but we'll talk about what I do now. So, and why I left AirTac. Um, so essentially my role right now is to make safety and training videos and e-learns for the fire program, which honestly doesn't sound as exciting as air attack, but it has been a great fit for my skill set. Um, finally, art school is paying off. <laughs> uh, I'm responsible for gathering images and footage for creating training materials which means sometimes I get to go out onto the fires and spend time with the crews, which is really awesome. I love getting to reconnect with my roots and be out there. And um, that was just what really drew me into the job was being able to be outside and be connected to nature. So the fact that I get to do that in my job and be creative is a real bonus. I get to write scripts for training videos. I plan the shot lists. Um, I film all the shots, uh, then I edit the footage into the final products that get used to train people. And, you know, I find that my experience in the different parts of the fire program, um, it's given me a good understanding of what the client needs um, when they have a project to do. So I know enough about you know, a lot of subject matter that I know what questions to ask to make sure that they get what they want. And uh, with my eye for creativity, I can capture images and footage that really demonstrates what needs to be conveyed in the videos. So it seems like the combination of my fire experience and my personal um, interest in creative endeavors you know, has really led to a good fit for me in this role. Um, as far as equipment, uh, my main camera body is a Canon 80D, and I just have a backup of a little Canon T5i. And my main lens, like my workhorse, is the 24 to 105 uh, Canon. And then I've got a really nice wide angle. It's a Tokina 11 to 16. It just it gives you a great um, 
great field of view, but there's no distortion in it. So I really like that for, especially inside the helicopter, I can capture like the whole helicopter with it. And for distant shots, um, I have a 100 to 400 um, Canon. And I have a little handheld stabilizer. I think I got that in 2016. And that was a game changer because previous to that, um, I was having to like haul my tripod around and try and get it set up to capture the shot while they're like moving <laughs> at a really fast pace. So um, the handheld just freed me up and I can capture so much more footage now. And um, yeah, so it's not, you know, it's it's good equipment. I mean, it's certainly not what cinematographers would use. But I find that, for me anyways, the Canon equipment um, is quite hardy. And I need that when I'm exposing it to like such harsh, dusty, you know, dirty, hot conditions. Um, I can be in the middle of the burn and there's ash coming up at my camera. I can be on a helipad and there's like just a ton of debris coming at my camera. And um, they've held up very well. As far as editing videos, I use Adobe, Adobe Premiere Pro. And for eLearns, um, I use Articulate Storyline. And I kind of feel like what I get to do is just a little bit similar to um, what the process of wildfire researchers get to do. So before I start a project, I have to learn the subject matter in depth. Uh, kind of like how researchers would go through all the previous research on a given topic. Um, from there, I'll work with the subject matter experts to write a script for the for a training video. Um, this is where it's important to really know the content so I can keep the video within scope for the students. Um, because nobody wants to watch even an extra minute of a training video if they don't have to. Um, wildfire researchers need to know their subject matter, obviously, um, so they can ask the right questions to figure out what needs to be researched. Um, the questions will set the scope of the research project. And like me, I would imagine researchers need to cut out all the fluff. Um, in my case, I'm answering to people taking a training course. But, you know, as researchers, you're answering to the institutions and the agencies funding your research. So then when all the planning is done to the greatest detail, we go out into the field. And for me, it's to collect footage. And for researchers, it's to collect data. And what we discover is that not everything can be planned for. And that's what zip ties and duct tape are for. And in the long run, um, the results of the research that you are doing will be used to provide information to other researchers and uh, perhaps even contribute to products that are useful for wild wildfire programs. Which, you know, leads me back into um, Sioux Lookout 33 when I got to spend time with all the researchers on that fire. And um, just, yeah, it was just reiterating, it was so great to see the enthusiasm that they had uh, for being on an active fire and just how appreciative they were uh, for the fire crews um, that were there helping them. And I got to interview, I think, pretty much all the researchers, and that was fantastic, uh, just getting one on one with them and and seeing what they were um, looking into themselves. But uh, one of the really common themes that came out of it was that collaboration. So it was, um, you know, the overarching collaboration between agencies, but um, it was also the collaboration between the researchers and the fire rangers. Because um, just, I know some of the researchers said that just seeing what they do on the fire line and and how they do it and what their priorities are, um, you know, may end up changing some of the research that they do. And, um, you know, 
if it's research that's built with the user in mind for real world world impacts for fire agencies, um, you know, it it can only benefit us. So I'm being selfish, <laughs> but you know, it can be anything from more accurate accurate rates of spread in a specific fuel type that uh, fire behavior analysts can use to predict fire growth, like that directly affects fire crew safety. Um, you know, to the smoke particulate tests that uh, Mark Grobsner was performing, and those will have real world impacts on how fire agencies view smoke inhalation going forward. So, you know, the intent of the, of the research is eventually to make applicable products for fire programs, then the more collaboration between researchers and practitioners, the better. And, you know, it is a big win for fire agencies. So, you know, I hope for you guys that you have um, even more investment with fire agencies to collaborate and uh, further your research. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, a little round of applause. I know it's always hard when we're <laughs> doing it virtually. Um, it's just so interesting to get that, that really day-to-day -day insight into you know, life as a forest firefighter, um, things I've never thought about. Um, yeah, so that was really, really interesting. And so we'd like to open up. We, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Um, I think Luke's going to try and um, chair that, but uh, you can either put your hand up and we can, and you can speak, or if you prefer, drop something in the chat. That's absolutely fine. And yeah, Chris, I'm sorry yeah, that you had the technology problems. Maybe in the yeah. online version, we can try and do something about that. Okay. So, yes, I was yeah. about to say, um, I will try and edit in all the uh, wonderful footage uh, in the post so uh, everyone can see and enjoy that. So, yeah, um, well, thank you. So, yeah, I yeah, can send you those clips. To, yes, no, please do. Um, so if anyone wants to put questions in the chat or unmute themselves and talk, um, I'm welcome to do that. So I guess I'll kick things off with kind of maybe a, just out of satisfying my pure, sort of personal curiosity, I want to know the worst wildlife experience you've had? Because you talked a lot about bears and bugs. <laughs> I just kind of want to get some sort of juicy story. <laughs> wildlife, okay. Well, um, you know, other than my uh, crew leader, one year being absolutely terrified of pine beetles. So every time a pine beetle would fly by and they love fires because they just chew on the wood, um, she would take the hose and whip it around and it didn't matter where you're standing. She was aiming for that, that pine beetle and you were going to get hit <laughs> if you're in the way, but, um, probably, uh, serious ones. Um, I was out in Alberta. Um, we were, um, just transferred there for the time being and we were on, uh, like a military reserve at Cold Lake air base and within this reserve um they use it for uh flying and and dropping munitions and you know doing all their all of their training all their flight training and testing and all that sort of stuff and there's no hunting in this area so there's a ton of bears and the bears are not scared of loud sounds because they're used to bombs going off so um i was just working on a hot spot down low, me and uh, my crew member. And I looked up and there was a big black bear, probably about, I'm gonna say 30 feet, um, you know, in front of us. And I just sort of slowly stood up and I kind of tapped my crew member and I said, don't shoot up, just really slowly get up. So he really slowly got up and we just sort of joined together <laughs> And I took my shovel and I put my hard hat on it and I raised it up just to look bigger. So I guess we looked big enough, but the bear actually stood on his hind legs and sniffed just to get a sniff of us. And that was, and it was in an open area. So there was nothing between us, no trees or anything, just like a small little ditch. And very fortunately, the bear, you know, didn't find us interesting. So he just eventually wandered off. But 
that was um, that was as close as I would want to be. <laughs> That's incredible. Thanks so much. Um, so, anyone else have any questions for Christine? I have a question. There's no other question. Um, I was just wondering. Thank you so much. That was really really interesting. Um, the current role that you're in. Um, were you kind of part of designing that or did it come about because the agency realized that they needed to be like doing this footage based training and is it something that's kind of widespread across agencies or is it very specific um, to Ontario? Um, I know British Columbia has their own videographer and um, we originally had two video well we had a videographer and then I was the video editing technician and the videographer was meant more for gathering footage for media and promotional um, items like that. But we did see, you're exactly right, we did see the need for, um, you know, video based training at the time. I mean, that was, I was hired for this role, I think, uh, 14 or 15 years ago. And you know, so we we really did see the need for that for someone specific um, for training to be able to do that. And um, another, actually, we're um, we're also and we're a little bit behind on it, um, but we are moving more so into e-learns as well as much as we can. Um, I think one of the challenges we have is that. Um, working within the government network, it can be a challenge to, um, I guess, have access to um, e-learning platforms. So if you don't have your own LMS, then it's a bit of a challenge to get that um, e-learn posted. And so we're just, you know, learning and, and figuring out how the best way to do that is. Great. Um, I think Angel uh, uh, so, um, Yes, yes, I do have a question. Thanks for the brilliant presentation, Christine. I'm yeah. just interested that you're saying you also do a function of coordinating the aerial support. When you're having about more than three aircraft operating in a space, do you coordinate that while you are on the ground or you also use a spotter aircraft where you would be then on the air and coordinate from the spotter aircraft? Um, it is, yeah, you're right, Angel. It is an aerial platform. So um, it's it's a bird dog aircraft. So it's an aero commander. And I don't know if you can see the footage that's playing, but that's what it looks like. And I work along beside the um, bird dog pilot and mm -hmm. we make sure, like I was saying, that there's um, 500 foot separation between each aircraft. So just kind of, um, if you can see this diagram, usually yeah. when I would be coming into a fire, I'd always be listening to who's dispatched. So I would know how many water bombers I had. And then I would always be listening to where the crews are being sent from and how many crews are coming what the helicopter numbers are and then I would um, sort of think about where I want to place those uh, aircraft uh, within the fire zone because you have the fire and then you have a five mile radius and that five mile radius is um, there's a no tam zone around that so no one without permission can fly into there and so I would usually come in and I would have my water bombers underneath me and I would be high enough to um, to allow for a helicopter to come in underneath me. All right, that, that answers me, thanks. Okay. <laughs> thanks, uh, anyone else? Hey, Adriana. I have a question. <laughs> um, yeah, so interesting. I was wondering, do you ever um, 
exhibit any of the photographs um, or video imagery, um, whether in sort of galleries or museums or, you know, sort of as a way of, sort of public engagement. I had some really interesting conversations about a week ago with um, some people in Portland about the yeah, Forestry Centre and exhibiting stuff from around the world around wildfires. And I was just wondering if you've done that or if you thought about that. And if not, maybe we should chat. <laughs> Um, we do have an amazing facility in Sault Ste. Marie in Ontario in Canada here. It's the Canadian Heritage Bush Plain Museum, and they've been excellent. They've done whole projects of like just they've got a whole section for wildfires. And then they've done, you know, uh, women in wildfire and then they've done women in aviation. And um, because we are so linked with aviation, um, they really, you know, go the extra effort to um, bring in forest firefighting into their displays. So they've been they've been excellent. But um, you know, certainly if there's images that you're looking for, um, you know, and and requesting you know some specific stuff, then certainly we can go through our communications branch and you know, request to to see if we can find some images for you, if you like. Thank you. Thank you. That's really good that you're doing this yeah, public, public engagement things. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh, I think Cathy. Yeah, thanks a lot for such an interesting talk and all the lovely footage and images as well. Um, I was just wondering, because you mentioned that one of the considerations for planning is where fires cross land that indigenous peoples have interest in or that they that is their land and i just wondered a bit more about the process by which i guess indeed those indigenous people are kind of involved in planning or or in operations i don't know if they are um we do have um indigenous coordinators and liaisons so if there is fire um within the area of a first nations community then we'll certainly be having our coordinators and liaisons reaching out, um, you know, to the chief and and to the the council, and um, just sort of really depending on what the fire is doing and letting them know. And um, I think uh, I think one really interesting thing is, and I came across this in 2021. It was really, you know, brought forward because there there was just so many fires in the north, and we were very very focused on protecting um, all of the all of the values what what we consider values, as in outpost camps, you know, homes and you know industry land, all of that stuff. But um, some of the community stepped forward and said you know, look, you, we have interest in land because there's certain plants that grow there. And if they burn over, it's gonna be a hundred years before those plants come back. So I think um, just sort of shifting our mindset to recognize that um, what, you know, is what we've typically considered a value, maybe we need to expand that a little bit more. It's really interesting. Thanks. Wonderful. Um, I'm not sure if we want to wrap this up at the hour or not, but we probably have time for one, maybe two questions remaining. So uh, I have I have a question for Luke. Oh, well, it's not about me, but I'm happy to <laughs> talk. What's your closest call on a forest fire? <laughs> Oh, well, you know that answer. Um, I'm not sure if you have the footage. No, no. Well, I don't want to make this about me. I had a very close call and um, Christine um, managed to capture at least the reaction to yeah. an incident where a uh, tree um, uh, fell very close to me. Um, so that was quite a... Um, I've, I've um, eaten out on that uh, story quite a lot. So uh, We need that footage. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, I was I was actually looking for that footage, Luke, and um, I did I did uh, say quite the expletive um, when I saw it happen. 
and I was going to try and cut that little bit and make a ringtone for you. <laughs> oh, that's. But <laughs> I'll, I'll see if I can find that. <laughs> um, great. Uh, so anyone, anyone else? Anyone else? Just got one last question by the looks of it. Yes, one last question. Just out of curiosity, when you're having uh, a aerial support and also you're having crown crews, it tends to be a whole lot of accidents sometimes, or let's say rather say risk for accidents. So do you have any specific techniques that you use to kind of try to avoid that risk or prevent or to reduce the, the chances of having a, an, an incident in that case? Um, an incident in the, sorry, in the, are you speaking about in the air again or just on the ground or? Either of, either on the air or in, in the ground, but I mean, when you're having both on site, when you're having aerial support working alongside with the ground crews. So, okay. I mean, there, there is a chance that when one drops a, 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 a load, then there might be a ground crew underneath or maybe there would be miscommunication somehow. So how do you kind of uh, reduce the chances of having those incidents? Yeah, so as an air attack officer, um, that is my job. That's like one of the top, top things that we do is to help or actually to fully avoid conflict between the aerial operators and the ground operators. And um, part of doing that is really good communication. So when a crew gets on the ground, um, as the air attack officer, I'm constantly, you know, checking in with them, seeing where they are and making sure that everyone on the ground knows what the strategy is and letting them know where the water bomber is going to be and to avoid that area. There's, there's an area called a drop zone and the crews cannot enter within that drop zone. So that leaves, a, you know, a very wide berth for the water bombers to work and then for crews to you know continue on the ground and if it comes to it then um, we will hold the crews back from advancing onto the fire um, in order to finish the aerial operations just so that there is no conflict all right okay thanks yeah um another like another thing is um and, and you talk about um, just avoiding accidents in general. And a major part of it is like the when you very first walk into the fire center, you are briefing yourself constantly, even before you walk in. You're you're you know, you walk out of your house and you're looking at the weather conditions. What are, what's the wind doing? Um, you know, just how dry does it feel? And then you go in and you get your your briefing. So you get your weather and your indices and what fires are mm -hmm. in the area, how much lightning has happened overnight. So you're you're gathering in all this information. And then you know how many crews are at each base and you know which helicopters are at those bases and will likely be dispatched if there's any crews on the fire. So you're always... Um, you're always mentally, oh, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Oh, there we go. But, yes. um, but yeah, so you're always, um, you're always assessing the situation. And um, as an air tag officer, I did have um, I did have times where crews were too close to the drop zone, so I knew that they got wet. And then there was a time when I knew a crew had gotten directly hit, and an, <laughs> it, I had actually moved that crew specifically to the spot so that they wouldn't get hit. And then I think. Because when you're 100 feet above the trees as a water bomber, you can't see. So, uh, you know, we have to be very specific about how we give our drop instructions. And I think 
probably what happened was the water bomber saw some orange and thought it was flame and it was the crew and the crew was directly hit. And um, very, very fortunately, there was um, no injuries. Uh, everyone was okay. But I'll tell you, when you're up in the air and you can't get down and see if that crew's okay and they, you know, take a little while to answer back because they're full of foam, your heart is in your throat. It's, you know, it's just the worst feeling in the world. Okay, thanks for the elaboration there. But we should end on a high note. <laughs> Somewhere else, we something else. <laughs> Somewhere in there. <laughs> Um, but I do think we have to wrap up now because it's actually a few minutes past the hour. Um, but a huge thank you to you, Christine. I thought it was very interesting. And uh, thank you for your time and sharing your stories and your footage and your pictures with us. And yeah, I um, hope you all enjoyed that and join us for our next fire and practice, which is actually quite soon, which is um, on the 5th of March. So it's a little bit more condensed than usual, but um, please do join us on the 5th of March. Um, and yeah, we should have some more over the year as well. So thank you very much, Christine. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, so, thank so you, much. Christine. And thank you. And I hope I get to work with you all again. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Bye. Great. Bye, everyone.